afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary, the um, uh, director of FPRI's Center for the Study of America in the West, uh, and your host and moderator for today's discussion. Um, I will also, I'm also a professor of history at the U.S. Army War College, and so I want to say that my opinions that I may express this conversation are my own and not those of the United States government, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. Army. Uh, but we are delighted to have you with us today for this conversation. And I want to say before we get started um, that conversations like this are pot made possible by our members and partners who we want to thank for their generous support for these programs. We ask if you are a new uh, a participant in an event like this, that you will consider becoming a member and partner of FPRI. Now, for our discussion today, I'm going to introduce our speaker uh, and our, our topic, uh, and then we will have a conversation, and you are invited to join that conversation. We ask that you join it by using the Q&A feature on the Zoom panel, not the chat box, but the Q&A feature. So with that in mind, on with the show. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan sits in the middle of one of the roughest neighborhoods in the world. Home to the ancient World Heritage Site of Petra, it is itself a relatively young state, which has had only two kings over the past seven decades. Both King Hussein, who rose to the throne at the age of 17 in 1953, and his son Abdallah, who succeeded Hussein after the latter's death from cancer in 1999, have been forced to play a weak geopolitical hand with some skill over the years, preserving both the stability and security of their land and of their dynasty. A crucial partner for both kings in their struggles has been the United States of America. Since the presidency of Harry Truman, American leaders have recognized the importance of Jordan for regional stability. Despite sometimes intense policy differences over Jordan's relations with its neighbor to the east, Iraq, as well as in the Israel-Palestinian question, partnership has been more common, and the U.S.-Jordanian relationship remains a key piece of American policy in the Middle East, much as Jordan, by its willingness to accept refugees and by its working for peace, has been an oasis of stability in the region, to use a phrase often attributed to the Hashemite Kingdom. The story of that relationship has recently been told by Bruce Rydell in his new book, Jordan and America, an Enduring Partnership. Drawing on his experiences in the region as both an intelligence officer and a presidential advisor, Rydell describes the twists and turns of this important yet understudied relationship and considers what we can expect in the future. So what interests and values have linked Jordan and the United States? What have been the most pronounced bones of contention? How should that relationship develop as the U.S. pivots away from the Middle East? These questions and yours will guide us in conversation with our guest, Bruce Rydell. Bruce Rydell is a senior fellow and director of the Brookings Intelligence Project, part of the Brookings Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. Rydell also serves as a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy. He retired in 2006 after 30 years of service at the Central Intelligence Agency, and he also served on the National Security Council and as a senior advisor on both South Asia and the Middle East to four presidents of the United States. Welcome to People, Politics, and Prose, Bruce Rydell. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, and a real um, opportunity to talk about uh, Jordan, but also the broader Middle East and American foreign policy in general. Uh, Jordan is um, all about geography, really simple. Uh, Jordan is uh, surrounded by uh, Syria to the north, Lebanon just a little bit of distance away, uh, Iraq to the east. Uh, they were briefly united as one kingdom. Uh, Saudi Arabia to the south, uh, with Egypt just a mile or two across the Gulf of Aqaba, and of course Israel and Palestine uh, to the west. Geography is everything. If Jordan is unstable, the entire region will get hung. If Jordan is stable, then the region can be stable. And successive American presidents have noticed that. And at what point, I mean, we talk about how the, the Hashemite Kingdom itself is formally constituted, I guess, as the Hashemite Kingdom in 1949. So this is in the really in the beginnings of this post-World post War II, early Cold War Middle East. Um, how did the, the first king, so before uh, 
before uh, 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 the first King Abdullah, I should say. How did he conceive of uh, Jordan's place in the region? Did he, uh, cons- especially considering that he was connected to the Hashemite rulers in other parts of the of the region as well? Uh, king Abdullah the first, or actually Emir Abdullah the first, weren't really kings until a little bit later. Um, always felt that he had been given uh, not second place, but third or fourth place. Uh, that Jordan was uh, a very small, weak kingdom. Uh, when the British first created it back in the 1920s, they referred to Jordan as the vacant lot, meaning there was nothing there. There were no cities, there was no agriculture, um, and it very much was that. Well, the first aspired to be much more. He aspired to be king of greater Syria, as they called it at the time, Jordan, Palestine and Israel, Syria and Lebanon, uh, and perhaps even throw in Iraq at some point, which was ruled by one by his brother. Um, it is from that aspiration that in 1948, uh, Jordan acquired West Bank, as we call it, and East Jerusalem. Um, he first tried to acquire it through negotiations with the Israelis. That broke down and he acquired it through force of arms, but then followed that with secret negotiations with the Israelis to try to stabilize the relationship. And that's what cost him his life. He was assassinated because of his secret contacts uh, with Israel. In fact, the reason he was in Jerusalem on the day he died was to have the secret meeting with the Israelis. And his young son, grandson actually, his young grandson, uh, saw him murdered in front of his eyes. And and that's been... I would say this this sort of shadow of tragedy that hangs over Jordan um, goes back to that, but also the the very complex relationship with the Israel Palestinian question, uh, the idea that Jordan does eventually it 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 uh, holds the the West Bank uh, until the sixty seven war, um, but remains the uh, the official am I correct the official protector of the holy places in Jerusalem. So the King of Jordan has this special role. And so Jordan has been expected to play a significant role in any peace process while also hosting or providing a home for hundreds, thousands of Palestinian refugees. And how have successive uh, rulers in Jordan tried to balance the existence of the Palestinian population in Jordan, their desire to aspire to leadership in the region, and a willing, a pragmatic willingness to seek peace with Israel. A clear majority of Jordanian citizens are either uh, Palestinians directly or descendants of Palestinians. And the king's wife, Queen Rania, is a Palestinian, mm-hmm. born uh, outside of Nablus on the West Bank. Uh, Abdullah I did something that no other Arab leader did uh, in the 1940s after the creation of the state of Israel. He gave Palestinians Jordanian citizenship. And that has continued to be the policy of Jordan ever since then. That they are, uh, at least in terms of legal terms, equal to any Jordanian, usually called East Bankers. Um, Mm -hmm. By doing that, the kingdom has advocated the Palestinian cause in a real and tangible way, giving Palestinians passports to allow them to travel around the world. Uh, it's very difficult if you're a stateless refugee to travel because you don't have a passport. Palestinians in Jordan, and including many Palestinians in the West Bank, continue to use Jordanian passports to travel around. Mm. As you noted, the king is also as outlined in the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty, um, the protector of the holy places in uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and I should note, not just the Muslim holy places, he also is the protector of the Christian holy places, um, which is you know, a little odd, but uh, that's the way uh, it has developed. Uh, it is the Jordanian uh, ministry that is responsible for these things that provides the key to open the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to the family that that opens it every morning. Um, So 
Grenadians have tried to balance um, their clear role in this uh, with uh, the fact that they have a Palestinian population, not all of which is enthusiastic about being led by a Hashemite. Well, and, and that's, of course, the question I was thinking about is you, you, that Jordan, unlike many other states in the region, Jordan offered citizenship to Palestinians. And yet this, I, I think about this has put Jordan in an odd uh, in-between position, because on the one hand, right, going back to 1970 uh, or, or, or before, the, the question has always been whether the Palestinian leadership would attempt to overthrow the Hashemite monarchy. And on the other hand, there are certain there are certain advocates within, say, Israel and among friends of Israel who say that the best solution to the Israel-Palestinian question is to just tell the Palestinians that they have a they have a state and that state is on the other side of the Jordan River. And that state is Jordan, which, if I understand correctly, is not a position the the, the kingdom itself wants to make, wants to take. And so that's that's kind of tough to be squeezed between. Uh, between essentially sort of Israeli desire to shove the Palestinian question onto them and Palestinian hostility towards the existing monarchy. How have they managed to stay in, to, to, uh, to stay sort of on, on top of this teetering balance? Uh, stepping carefully <laughs> uh, and um, keeping close to big brother, Washington, mm -hmm. all of these occasions. Um, Yes, uh, the late 1960s, uh, the Fedayeen movement uh, tried to topple the Hashemite thing. Uh, there were several attempts on the life of uh, King Hussein. Um, they came very close to succeeding. But in the end, through very clever work by the king and his intelligence services, they were able to thwart that. And since 1970, Jordan has been basically stable with very little uh, of the kind of violence that's so endemic in the rest of the Middle East. There have been no intifadas. Uh, there's obviously not been another civil war. There have been some acts of terrorism, but on the whole, um, if you look around the region, this is one of the safer places to live. And that's particularly true today with Syria and civil war, Iraq going through all kinds of crises, Saudi Arabia bogged down in a war in Yemen, and the West Bank uh, and East Jerusalem are volatile as always. Uh, Jordan, in that sense, is a real success story. Uh, it has taken the vacant lot. And while it is not a rich country, um, it is relatively prosperous and a relatively safe place to be. And I think this is one of the keys to the success of the uh, Hashemite monarchy is that they can point to the Jordanian people no, you don't have a Mercedes like everybody does in Qatar, but you are safe and you're living in a much safer environment than you would be in almost any country around us with a relatively benign government. Uh, yes, it's a police state. Every country in the Middle East is a police state. This is a relatively benign police state. Um, which is which is a parrot parrot I understand the point that you're trying to make but is a it's a it's 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 a paradoxical thought right that a, a police state but um, yeah. what is the state what what is the uh, what kind of restrictions on freedom exist in Jordan outside of the fact that the the, the monarchs certainly control the executive branch if you will but what uh, you know are there elections is there a free press how does uh, what what does daily life like in Jordan there are elections in Jordan uh, elections for parliament that actually meets, uh, passes legislation. Um, the press is relatively free. It's not totally free. Um, the, the, the one big restriction is uh, you can't criticize the king. The king. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, Which there are smart people in the Jordanian press who don't criticize the king directly but who talk about corruption in society, all of which points the finger. Um, and, and to a certain degree, that's tolerated. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There is a lot of criticism of the Israeli-Jordan peace treaty. There's no question that if the Israeli-Jordan peace treaty was put to a popular vote, uh, Jordanians would, would turn it down. Mm -hmm. And that was true when it was signed, and it's even more true today. Though there's a little glimmer of improvement in Israeli-Jordanian relations with the new government uh, in Jerusalem, um, 
that's that's interesting to see. Right. But what you okay. you uh, as long as you don't criticize the king or queen directly, uh, you have a fair amount of latitude uh, to um, speak your mind. Right. What is uh, one of our one of our listeners, uh, O.D. Mayer, points out that if there's Big Brother United States, Little Brother Israel does play a role in helping to keep Jordan stable. Um, what is the state of uh, so practical cooperation, right? There's the peace treaty. Yes, we know that relations weren't terrific in the latter um, Netanyahu government. But what uh, what is the what, what kind of practical cooperation exists between Israel and Jordan today? Uh, there's several things. Probably the one that's most important is security cooperation. I, mm -hmm. I can say going well be well before uh, the peace treaty. Uh, the Israeli intelligence service, the Mossad, and the Jordanian intelligence, service, the PID, uh, were very closely connected and pass information literally 24 hours, 365 days a year. Uh, sometimes that's with the participation of the Americans, but most of it is bilateral directly between the two of them. And In that regard, it's yeah. worth noting that the Israeli that King Hussein negotiated with the peace treaty uh, was the director of the Mossad. That's the person he felt most comfortable with dealing with uh, inside of Israel. There's also cooperation on uh, water, uh, and there's mm -hmm. been agreement to uh, provide more water from Israel uh, to uh, Jordan. Uh, there's electricity cooperation, there's natural gas cooperation, um, and there's overflight cooperation. Uh, both airspaces are open for commercial use. So th there is considerable amount of cooperation um, because the treaty is so unpopular uh, the king and successive Jordan Jordanian governments don't point to that mm -hmm. don't want to remind the Jordanians but it's very important to the stability of the kingdom and it's I would say very important to the stability of uh, Israel and the West Bank so that they have the cooperation of the Jordanians on these kind of issues right you mentioned water, and uh, just to, to 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 drill down, if you will, on a on a problem that Jordan definitely faces. Right, it's an arid country, and and a land and a largely landlocked, not completely landlocked, but it, there is the problem of water access. Um, uh, I know that there is uh, the Israelis and the Jordanians have talked about building a canal from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea to to uh, stabilize the water table and to include desalination problems projects in there as well. Um, but those are those are big infrastructure projects. And um, what are the chances that Jordan and Israel could, uh, I, I suppose, where would they go for funding for big projects like that? And how would they make them work? Well, one that's most crucial is desalinization. Yeah. Um, the uh, plans to do that not gotten off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's an area where the United States really can make a difference. Uh, we could help to stabilize both uh, West Bank uh, and Jordan uh, with the construction of desalinization facilities, um, which would probably be mostly on the Mediterranean coast of Israel. But you could try to build one in the, in the Gulf of Aqaba. You could try to build one along the joint border that uh, is shared between Israel and Jordan down there. That would be a very impressive um, building piece. Now, where's the money going to come from? Uh, always a good question. Um, seems to me at the end of the day, we all know where the money is going to come from. It's going to come from the American taxpayers. Uh, we already fund Israel and Jordan are the, I think the, first and third largest recipients of American assistance. Mm -hmm. Only Egypt is in that league. Um, and the amount of aid to Jordan has gone up steadily uh, in the last decade because of Jordan's role in fighting ISIS and helping to um, uh, stabilize Iraq and other things uh, in providing a home for American aircraft to attack ISIS. Uh, so it's in our interest. Mm -hmm to see this stability. And water is a huge problem for the Jordanians down the road. And there just isn't going to be more water uh, in Jordan. There just isn't that there. 
So it's going to have to be brought in. Uh, and the only feasible way I think possible uh, is with the cooperation of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so has the United States made cooperation with Israel a condition of continued support for Jordan? So how, how, how directly has the United States tried to leverage its support for Jordan uh, into Jordanian support for normalization with Israel? Well, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan, every American who's looked at the problem of Israel-Palestine has also looked at Jordan uh, and said, if not making Jordan-Palestine, at least get the Jordanians involved uh, in, in this issue. Um, the, the Jordanians want to be careful here. Uh, they do not want to be Palestine. Uh, they, they very much see themselves as uh, separate, and they are supporters of the two-state solution, uh, despite the fact that the two-state solution now increasingly looks like it's um, a mirage in the, in the distance. Uh, but they, they are very much supportive of the two-state solution. Uh, and when King, when uh, Joe, President Biden called King Abdullah uh, this past March, uh, the readout the Americans gave highlighted American support for the two-state solution. It was an important thing for the King to hear from the Americans. So both sides know, and the Israelis know, that the best way for this relationship to work is a triangular partnership. Um, tricky because Jordan is the, by far the weakest here. Um, but Jordan has for 75 years uh, been able to play a role bigger than its stature uh, by good leadership, uh, first under Hussein and then under his son, uh, and um, seems to be continuing able to do that. Now, there have been some signatures, significant economic problems in Jordan, uh, particularly since the pandemic. Um, there aren't a whole lot of people touring Petra these days, which is, um, a, problem. Which is a big problem. That's a key uh, way to get foreign exchange into the country. Um, so the economy is basically flat, uh, making the Jordanians even more dependent on American economic support. Um, in this environment, uh, there is concern in Israel about the stability of the kingdom, uh, but there's no pimp. The kingdom is not the kingdom is not on the precipice of the descent into uh, destabilized phase. Uh, but there are some warning indicators out there uh, that it's important to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> To talk about the, the U.S.-Jordanian relationship, I want to come back to the internal situation in Jordan in a bit, but I want to bring in this, you know, the, the U.S.-Jordanian relationship. Uh, when I think about periods, and you describe them, periods of intense disagreement between the United States and Jordan. Right? One of them was during the first Gulf War. Uh, another was, uh, was during, uh, uh, or I guess what, this would have been in the post it, it, through the 90s and the discussion about it was a, there was dis disagreement about Iraq, but also disagreement about how to handle the Israeli-Palestinian question. What was the nature of the disagreement with Jordan about Saddam Hussein and Iraq? Um, the worst day in the life of King Hussein, by his own words, was when the Hashemite monarchy in Iraq was overthrown in 1958 by a revolutionary government. Uh, his uh, uh, entire Iraqi branch of uh, Hashemite family was executed and murdered in the course of a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, he has always tried to build a relationship with Iraq since then. In the 1980s, during the Iran-Iraq War, Jordan was the uh, supply line uh, to Iraq. Uh, it was dangerous to bring supplies in through the Persian Gulf the Iranians could bomb them from their airplanes, but you could bring supplies in from the port of Aqaba driving through Jordan and into Iraq. And then there was literally almost bumper to bumper traffic. Uh, I remember traveling there. It was like bumper to bumper traffic from Aqaba all the way to Baghdad. Um, in the course of the war, 
uh, King Hussein also made three dozen or more visits to Baghdad uh, and got to be quite friendly with Saddam Hussein. They're worlds apart in the kind of people they are, uh, but the war brought them together. Uh, and the king saw himself as the way to integrate Iraq into the global order. And it was the king that uh, introduced the CIA uh, to the Iraqis in 1982 and began providing intelligence, mm -hmm. which intelligence which was critical to the Iraqis uh, surviving the war. Um, so 1990 comes along and the king uh, does not want to break relations with Iraq. Uh, and he seeks what he calls an Arab solution to the problem of Kuwait. Well, President George H.W. Bush uh, didn't think there was an Arab solution. Um, and while he never said you're either with us or you're against us, uh, you were either part of the coalition or you weren't part of the coalition. The relationship did deteriorate very badly. Now, there were some who were telling the king, you're, you're way too cozy to Saddam Hussein. Probably uh, one, of those, one of those certainly was his uh, um, brother, then Crown Prince Hassan. Uh, and I think there's also solid evidence that Queen Noor was probably telling him this is not a very good idea. I don't have exact evidence of that, but reading between the lines of her uh, really excellent uh, autobiography, you get the impression she did. But he was heedless of this, and he stuck with Saddam, and he paid a penalty for it. Um, uh, and he also paid a penalty with the Saudis. Uh, but the Bush administration was also smart enough to know that when the war was over, and the Bush wanted to turn to the Arab-Israeli conflict, which he'd promised the Saudis and the Egyptians and everyone, he would, as soon as the war was over, he was going to turn to this. But the first stop for Secretary of State Baker was going to be Amman, Jordan. Um, and that's, in fact, what happened. And in, a, in an interesting way, Israel-Palestinian conflict became King Hussein's ticket back to Washington and back into the good graces of the Americans. And that became even more true once Bill Clinton became president. Um, we think back to the Clinton era and, and the, the Oslo agreements and uh, uh, Camp David and um, why River, uh, I, I think back to them and mostly remember sleep deprivation at all of those meetings. Uh, but the, the one agreement that turned out that had survived uh, is the Israel-Jordan uh, peace agreement. Uh, and here the king did not want to deal with the Americans. The Americans were there to, to support it, uh, to uh, help fund it, um, and to uh, cater the peace treaty agreement, uh, literally, uh, but he wanted to deal directly with the Israelis because he felt that was the way he would get the best possible deal. Um, There's a famous image from that, from those days, in that agreement, and that is uh, Yitzhak Rabin and King Hussein lighting each other's cigarettes, um, which I guess, say, uh, uh, not the healthiest way to seal a friendship, <laughs> but a, uh, but I would say a quintessentially Middle Eastern way to seal a friendship. And right. um what did the death of Yitzhak Rabin mean for this phase of uh, Jordanian, both Jordanian-Israeli relations, but also the Jordanian-American relations? Uh, it was a devastating. Um, uh, Yitzhak Rabin and King Hussein saw themselves both as soldiers mm -hmm. uh, and that they could communicate as soldiers. Uh, and literally, when the final days before the treaty was signed, the two of them put a gigantic map down on the ground and crawled around on it on their hands and knees, discerning where the border would exactly go. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing if you think. Um, the king was devastated by Rabin's assassination. Uh, he came to the funeral, um, very moving. Uh, king Hussein, uh, was a uh, really terrific speaker when he when he put it on, um, and could be very moving and quite uh, eloquent. Um, 
He did not have a very good relationship with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, neither did uh, his son. Uh, the relationship was quite frosty uh, for the last decade or so. Um, here, there's some little glimmers, more than little glimmers. There is some sign of uh, real uh, conversations now going on between uh, Abdullah and uh, at least parts of the, the new Israeli government. Um, there has already been a new water agreement, um, significant as we discussed earlier. Um, and uh, with the Biden administration, I think we, we now have a, a real opportunity here, not for another uh, summit meeting, uh, but for a warming of the relationship, um, in the kind of areas that we've spoken about already, uh, mm -hmm. that would be in our uh, mutual bilateral uh, interest. So, and to, to, uh, to both get to the person, the talk about personalities for a moment, but also to get at a question that's clearly on the minds of our listeners. And it's in, uh, in, in, in my questions too, King Abdullah, um, who uh, has, has, a, uh, has had good PR in the United States and uh, is, is generally well thought of, um, has had some, uh, has had some bad headlines lately. Right, the Pandora Papers and its suggestions of what he's been doing with his money. Uh, we know that Jordan Jordan's not a wealthy country, but the uh, the the monarch's family has a great deal of personal wealth. And what has the, what have the revelations about the Pandora Papers? As Michael McDowell and both Harry, both Michael McDowell and Harry Brodine asked this question, what have the uh, the Pandora Papers revelations done for Abdullah's credibility as a leader, his popularity? Um, and his his value, let's say, as a uh, as a geopolitical actor in the region. Well, perhaps the most important thing is that the Washington Post ran that story on the day that my book came out, <laughs> uh, which was extremely helpful for a book promotion. And uh, Brookings Press uh, really uh, wants to thank the Washington Post a lot for time. <laughs> Um, I won't. I won't raise any. I won't suggest anything about your your background and about anything that might have gone into helping to make sure that piece of information got purely out. Purely coincidental. Or purely coincidental. Uh, Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's hard to tell uh, what this has done inside Jordan mm -hmm. because the, the king has not allowed uh, open discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we can say is this. Um, his father had pretty wealthy um, real estate uh, abroad uh, in the United Kingdom, in London. Um, the Jordanians have long since been a British colony, but the Hashemite family has very strong connections to uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, almost all of them have gone to Sandhurst for at least some point of their career. Um, so that's relationship. Uh, King Hussein had an absolutely gorgeous uh, mansion uh, in um, Montgomery County, uh, just outside of, of uh, Washington, uh, River House, uh, was sold later to the owner of the Washington Redskins. Um, and it's quite a nice from, property. From one, from one monarch to another. Sorry. Yeah, sort of. So <laughs> um, Jordanians do not are not shocked mm -hmm. that their king has these residents. Uh, the lack of transparency about it, um, the king has a pretty good answer to, which is for security reasons, he doesn't want to advertise where he or other members of the family may be residing because they have been the target of assassination attempts. Uh, the king and Queen Rania uh, were the target of an Al Qaeda plot. Uh, back in uh, 1998, if my memory is right, uh, while they were going to vacation um, in the Aegean uh, Sea. Um, I think it's the properties in Malibu that are the most questionable. Uh, why does he really need three properties uh, in California? Um, well, Apparently, the queen really likes it there, which I think is a big part of it. Um, and uh, it's probably also an investment. In the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Iranians so far seem to be um, not that muffled by this. Uh, and um, after the initial disclosures, um, this issue is, I wouldn't say gone away, but it doesn't have the profile that it had even several weeks ago. Hmm. Um, will that last? We'll see. Uh, if, if I was the king's advisor, one thing I would advise him to do is to make clear that these properties are owned by the court, not by him personally, so that there is less of the sense that this is a um, uh, one man or man and wife properties, but that they belong in some way or another uh, to the Jordanian um, country mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, that doesn't mean that when you sell River House, uh, proceeds are going to go into the Bank of Jordan, uh, but it does mean that, that you acknowledge that this is fully is used for official purposes. Mm -hmm. as well as for uh, private. Right. I mean, I can see where it, 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 it creates complicated, uh, complicated issues when you're talking about uh, uh, the, the role of the king as representative of the, of the state, especially in, in a monarchy, right? Obviously, the very existence of a monarchy in a relatively poor country raises all kinds of questions of, of uh, of equity and uh, questions of uh, uh, you know, what's what what is all this wealth for, but um, but you but the question of Abdullah then his his uh, international profile his work his relationship with the U.S. you describe in the book how his relations with the Trump administration were not terribly good. Um, has there been uh, a, a a measurable improvement or measurable change in the relationship since Joe Biden became president? Very much so. Um, Abdullah, like Hussein, um, tries immediately when a new president comes in uh, to broker a relationship and build personal bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, and Abdullah tried that with Trump, but it, it went nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump made it very clear that his interests in the Middle East were Saudi Arabia and Israel and not Jordan. Um, and the so-called deal of a century uh, promised annexation of the Jordan River Valley, uh, which probably would have been the death meal for the Israel-Jordan. Uh, Joe Biden knows the king well. Um, he's known him before he was king. Uh, Joe Biden was the Iraq desk officer for Barack Obama uh, and traveled to Baghdad repeatedly and almost always went through Amman on the way there. Um, so there is a long-standing relationship. And when the uh, Jordanians uncovered a conspiracy in March, uh, to destabilized the kingdom. Uh, the king was quick to receive a phone call uh, from Joe Biden. It also doesn't hurt that the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, William Burns, was ambassador to Jordan when King Hussein passed away and Crown Prince Abdullah ascended to the throne. So they have a long-standing, close relationship. Um, the CIA and, and the Hashemite monarchy go back a long way, well back into the 1950s. But I would hazard to say that it's never been as good as it is uh, with a former American ambassador to Jordan uh, sitting in the director's office on Langley. So the relationship is strong um, and there's no more talk of annexation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in that sense, uh, things are looking up for the Jordan. Right. So you so mentioned, you mentioned the, 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 the special relationship between the uh, Hashemite monarchy and the CIA. And unsurprisingly right you 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 also have a long-standing relationship with the cia but but your your formal roles and your your roles in u.s jordanian relations have been uh have been varied and i, I i'm curious to know how you would describe right the the events that you yourself witnessed the the policy uh discussions that you were able to be a part of both working as working for the agency but also working with the national security council 
And how uh, was was Jordan one of the special parts of your uh, your portfolio, or how did that how did your interest in Jordan get uh, deepened? Uh, very much so. Um, I went down to the National Security Council uh, in the summer of 1991, right after the Gulf War. I had been the uh, deputy chief of the CIA's Persian Gulf Task Force, um, and in the fall of 1992, um, when H.W. was running for re-election, his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, sent me to Jordan uh, with, a, with a message. Uh, and the message was, let's get over the Iraq war. Uh, it's time to put that behind us. And it's time to develop back to where Jordan and America used to be. Um, and to get you uh, back to Kenny Bunkport as soon as we can past the election. Um, and, I, and I took that message. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, king very nicely uh, uh, arranged a lunch for me and him, the CIA station chief, and his chief of intelligence. Uh, the American ambassador was notably absent <laughs> at this lunch, which was... Uh, a little bit of a bureaucratic problem for him. And ironically, of course, um, Mr. Bush did not win re-election and President Clinton came in and sure enough, his national security advisor asked me a few days later, would I go to Jordan with a message from President Clinton? And it was pretty much the same message. Let's put the Iraq war behind us. And for Clinton, it was much easier to put the Iraq war behind him and focus on uh, Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking and an Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. Uh, this time the American ambassador did come with me. Um, so ever since 1990, 91, uh, I've, had a, I've had a small, but I think uh, uh, important role uh, in US-Jordanian relations. And it gave me the opportunity to get to know King Hussein quite well. Uh, and to see what kind of a, of a really warm and generous person he is. You always knew you were in the, uh, in the room with, with the royal, but he had a very disarming way of making it feel like it was just two guys um, you know, meeting without um, uh, disparity in authority that was in fact really there. Right. Uh, and uh, his son um, has the same way of, of making it very easy to deal with and to, and to talk to. And both of them like America. They like to come to the United States. Um, in that sense, it's, it's not a surprise that he bought a house in California. He likes California um, and they like to come here uh, and they like dealing with Americans. Um, and in that sense, uh, writing this book has been for me uh, a change because my previous books were all about countries that I really didn't like or terrorist organizations uh, that obviously I didn't like. Um, but it's refreshing to work on a country where you genuinely like not only the leadership, but the people uh, and even as um, the book says, an enduring friendship. Well, and and this gets to uh, gets to a point that Josh Krasna asks in a question that I want to sort of rephrase, and that is, if the United States is indeed uh, recalibrating its foreign policy priorities. And, you know, if we're finally pivoting somewhere, whenever we talk about pivoting, basically, we're always saying we, we want to get less involved in the Middle East. Um, and there are, of course, different ways to imagine being less involved in the Middle East, right? One is just to pack up and leave and let somebody else worry about the whole situation, which is unlikely, although one could say that's what we did with the Syrian question by letting the Russians take care of it. But the other one is uh, to hope that uh, the United States can pull back and that our friends will continue to do the things that we would like to see done in the region. Um, is it likely, is it possible, uh, is it desirable for Jordan to play a, a leading role in, uh, 
in in advancing you know what should be common interests in the middle east or do the jordanians have to deal with the rivalry continue to deal with the rivalry say with the emiratis and the saudis um uh and and how in just to throw one other thing in there is where does the relationship with Iran fit in this entire vision for the Middle East, especially if the United States backs, if the United States steps back, how, how could Jordan step forward? Is Jordan likely to step forward to fill the policy goal? Well, the United States is going to have less interest in the Middle East because oil, despite the temporary surge now, uh, is going to be less and less important in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and every president since White David Eisenhower has identified oil as the reason why we're in the Middle East. Right. Um, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait had no oil. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, President Bush sending a half a million Americans uh, to defend Saudi Arabia. Um, Jordan has no oil. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, doesn't really matter to them. Uh, but what it does have is location, and particularly that location next to Israel. Because if oil is one of the reasons why we're in the Middle East, a second reason is Israel. You can debate the, the appropriateness of that it is debated all the time. But it is a fundamental reality of America that our relationship with Israel is one of the uh, bipartisan core uh, principles of American foreign policy. And Israel, Israel's importance is not going to fade, whatever the pivot is in Asia. And in that sense, Jordan uh, is probably the Arab country that is going to be the biggest beneficiary of continuing American interest in a stable. And we're already seeing that uh, some military equipment uh, and personnel that had previously been deployed in Gulf states is now being redeployed to Jordan. But we now really have the largest on the ground military presence of American troops that we've ever had before. In fact, we've never seen anything even approaching. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, of course, is that uh, it's a lot farther to fire a missile from Iran to Jordan than it is from Iran to Abu Dhabi. Uh, and it's much more difficult to carry out a terrorist operation in Jordan, which has a very, very effective internal security apparatus than it would be, say, in Abu Dhabi or Bahrain or places like that. Um, the king has been careful. Uh, king Abdullah has actually gone to Iran uh, which is very unusual for an Arab leader to do. Um, they've not broken relations. They, they have talked about the uh, uh, Shia Crescent. Uh, I know from the, from the correspondent that he actually mentioned that too, that, you, that he literally tried to pull the words back into his mouth the minute he said it because he realized it wasn't going to sit well um, with Shias in general and Iran in particular. Um, the last thing the, the Jordanians want is an American or Israeli military operation against Iran. Uh, Israeli military operation in Iran would almost certainly pass through Jordanian airspace, um, which would, the king would obviously not like to see that happen. Um, and the, and the Jordanians will tell you that a military operation in Iran uh, will be four or five times more devastating than the American invasion of Iraq uh, in 2000, because Iran is a much bigger country with many, many more people uh, and with uh, connections to terrorist groups like Hezbollah uh, that can carry out operations literally around the world. Right. Um, so the... Jordan finds itself in, in a somewhat anomalous position of uh, perhaps being the least likely to be uh, left uh, by the Americans as we pivot towards Asia or wherever we're pivoting to.
wherever we're pivoting to. Well, and, and this, I think, is, is an interesting question uh, that uh, you know, Ben uh, Pributok asks, which uh, was also on my mind, is Jordan has uh, generously uh, accepted an awful lot of refugees from Syria, from Iraq. Uh, and what, what, has, what kind of impact has that had? on Jordanian stability and how long can the Jordanians be expected to continue to host so many refugees when they, there will be pressure for those refugees, they may want to go someplace else and the Jordanians may want them to go someplace else because they may not be able to uh, continue to host them, which is of course creating a big problem or potential problem for other places, especially for the Europeans who uh, I think it's not too much to say. The Europeans live in fear of the moment when uh, that many refugees decide that they that staying in Jordan is not good enough and they want to go to Europe. So what is the, what is the, the, the situation with Jordan and the refugee question? Um, what the Jordanians would like to see with Syria is a replay of what happened with Iraq. Uh, during the civil war uh, in Iraq after the 2002 uh, invasion, many, many, uh, particularly Sunnis, but also Shias, Mm -hmm. came to Jordan. Uh, with the relatively return of stability to Iraq, many of those people have gone home. Mm -hmm. Not all of them. There's a, there's a number that have stayed permanently. What, what Jordan would like to see is the same thing happen with Syria. Um, that there'd be a relatively return to stability. Uh, the king um, had a phone call with Bashar Assad just uh, a week or so ago the first he's had in, in a decade. Um, and that appears to be part of a Jordanian policy of saying, well, Bashar Assad was a terrible leader and he destroyed his country, but he won the war and we have to learn to live with him. <laughs> and that means reopening relations. That means restoring trade relations. And hopefully at some point, it means that some of those Syrian refugees will feel safe enough go home and go back to Syria. Because these waves of refugees only add to Jordan's economic problems. The reason Jordan has such high unemployment is because many of these refugees will work um, in jobs that Jordanian citizens uh, get pushed out of because a Syrian refugee will work for less than a Jordanian uh, citizen will work for. So I, and I, I, have, to, I have to assume that uh, behind the scenes, uh, the King, uh, Biden, and Bill Burns have talked about all of this, and the United States is um, quietly saying, okay, let's see where this goes. So you think the United States would, would recognize an advantage in normalization of relations between Jordan and Syria? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, so what if something were to happen to Abdullah, May God forbid. But if something were to happen to a, a Abdullah, who is next in line to the throne? And what do we know of that person's uh, political outlook? The next in line is his son, uh, Crown Prince Hussein. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have to either be a Hussein or an Abdullah. To be king of <laughs> Pretty clear. I guess a, a Hussein would be next in the rotation right. then, right? Okay. Yeah, the rotation is due for a Hussein next. Um, He's been educated at the U.S. Uh, he went to Georgetown. Uh, he has spent a lot of time in the U.S. Um, he's had a lot of military training, uh, both with the British and with the United States. Um, the King has increasingly included him in his conversations with foreign leaders uh, and in planning. Uh, he accompanied the King uh, and the Queen when they came to the U.S. Um, uh, this summer. Um, not married though. Uh, and um, you know, one of the first responsibilities of a monarch is to uh, ensure that there's a backup. <laughs> I should and, imagine, right? And, I imagine his mother might have mentioned this to him at one time or another too. Yes. Uh, so um, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, there are other potentials um, there are other uh, uh, half brothers. Um, they don't all get along that well, mm -hmm. uh, but there is there are backups if necessary. 
But Hussein really is the, the future uh, for Jordan. And um, one of the things the United States could do productively here uh, is help give him a higher profile uh, by having him come to the United States and let's say meet with the vice president uh, for an extended uh, uh, visit. Um, you know, the inherent weakness of monarchies is the passing of the monarch uh, can lead to a period of instability. It didn't and do that in 1999 when uh, King Hussein died, but that was very much on everyone's worry. Well, and I guess that's the, the so far, right? The Jordanians have been fortunate for the past couple of generations and uh, Jordan's partners in the Middle East have been fortunate to have Jordan as a, uh, as this oasis of stability, if you will. And uh, the United States and Jordan in enduring friendship uh, is available in bookstores. Uh, it's available from the Brookings Institution directly. Bruce Rydell, I am sorry to say that we've just about used up our hour, but thank you so much for joining us to talk about your book and to talk about this uh, complicated and fascinating relationship. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Very much appreciated. And FPRI would very much like to thank our members and partners for making this possible. We would like to thank all of you for joining us for this conversation, whether live here on Zoom or watching it later on YouTube. We hope that if you have enjoyed what you have heard and seen today, that you will tell a friend and that you will bring a friend next time, that you will consider supporting the work of FPRI as we try to understand and explain our complicated world. Our conversation today is just the beginning. The world goes on and we will be here to discuss it at FPRI. Please, to keep up on future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose or other events from FPRI, visit our website, fpri.org, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. Until next time, however, for all of us at FPRI, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>